Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Earthworks Hub. Today we're going to be talking about finance. So somewhere along the line, you're going to have to get finance. So whether you're just starting out or you're already an established business and you want to upgrade or get some new equipment or a truck, you're going to need finance. So I thought, you know what, let's get someone in, a specialist that can tell us all about how it works, what it's like to get finance, the process, and all that sort of stuff. So with me today, I've got Robbie Moore. He's from Network Finance. Uh, I've actually used Robbie in the past as well for finance, so I can definitely vouch for him. Um, let's see what he has to say. Thanks for coming on the program, Robbie. So Robbie, can you just uh, start by telling us a little bit about yourself and the company that you work for? Yeah, sweet. So um, I uh, contract to Network Finance. We're based at Cooparoo in Brisbane. Um, company's probably been around 25 years or so, I suppose, and I've contracted there for the past 15 months. Prior to that, I was based in Toowoomba, where I worked as a broker for yeah, 14 years up there before moving down here, just a bit more central. Um, and out yeah, of network finance, we sort of do equipment finance, um, got guys in there that do home loans, business loans, that sort of stuff. I, I predominantly specialise in equipment finance. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. We sort of cover, I cover sort of anywhere in Australia, predominantly Victoria, Queensland. You know, scattering of clients in New South Wales, Tassie and WA. So, yeah, it's all pretty good. Yeah. That's it. And who who are your sort of typical clients? Like, are they big, large companies or your small sort of owner operators? Yeah, no, I generally work with smaller guys. Uh, generally, any sort of one from the sort of new guys just starting out to maybe turnovers up to ten million dollars with some transport companies. But yeah, predominantly sort of. Yarn or operators or guys that might have sort of four, five, six machines. Um, I do some finance for a guy that's got a fairly sizable rental business out at Ballarat, but yeah, he's probably one of the bigger ones. So yeah, so mate, yeah, predominantly smaller guys. All right, no worries. Um, all right, so maybe we'll just go straight to, I suppose, talking about the finance itself. Um, so just say I'm a I'm a owner operator uh, about to start a business. And what would be like the process, like the steps involved in getting finance for, like, just say, a new truck? Um, so the steps involved, like, before you sort of went too far down the track, I'd probably engage with a broker just to work out what sort of what the parameters are for getting finance. Obviously, new businesses, they're probably going to want some sort of deposit. Um, you probably you're going to need generally a work letter or work contract. Um, so yeah, if you sort of engage with a broker, they can let you know what you're going to need to get, um, basically to get some sort of pre-approval before you sort of go shopping for either excavator or truck, <laughs> truck or whatever. But yeah, the, the two big things generally with new businesses nowadays, are uh, you're probably going to need somewhere between 10 and 20% deposit and you're going to need a, a work letter or, or, um, or work contract, um, confirming some work for the asset you're buying. Mm. And what and about, um. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and obviously probably make sure you've got good credit, um, that type of thing, but yeah. Yeah. Well, what about, um, like, the, in the past, they used to say you need at least two years' worth of um, financials and stuff. Is that still still the case? With some banks, yes. Uh, some banks won't look at anyone until they've been in business two years. There are some, like, yeah, there are sort of, I suppose, second-tier lenders and some that will do fund new businesses. Some some banks will as well. If it like, probably to get bank finance as a new business, you you would probably need to be a property owner as well. You know, if you've got if you if you're sort of I suppose working for a guy operating his excavator or whatever, and you're going to be then go and subcontract to him um, doing same sort of work just with your own machine. They'd probably look at that type of thing. Um, but yeah, so you, we we can definitely fund new businesses. It's just a bit a bit trickier. Um, yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah. And why why do people um, or why should people go to like a broker rather than straight to the bank? Like, is it is it any sort of big difference? Oh, di different banks like different things. Um, so some banks only want to fund new gear, um, whereas some of the banks will look at stuff that that's a bit older and. Um, yeah, like, like I said, some banks will, won't touch you unless you've been in business two years. 
So if, if you only go to your bank, you're limited as to what their parameters are, whereas you go to a broker, you know, we deal with all the banks, all the, all the sort of finance companies, so we can generally fit it somewhere. Um, we have obviously a number of different options, whereas the banks only have their, their option and that's it. So it gives you yeah. a bit more variety. And I, I find when, unless you're a reasonable sized business with a bank, like you could bring up the bank, they don't tend to get back to people so much. I suppose they're under the pump. Maybe they're short staffed. Um, so yeah, whereas you cut to a broker, I'll say someone comes to me or whoever their broker is, they'll basically do it all. They'll get all the stuff from the accountant. They'll do it all and we try to make it, you know, as easy and seamless as possible for the person, not have you guys running around chasing stuff up generally. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. What about, um, so I suppose when you get new equipment, usually the dealership will sort of help you out and do all the invoices and paperwork for you and send all it, send it on to the finance company. If yep. you're buying a second-hand machine, like what's, what's involved with that? Do you need to get some, what sort of paperwork do you need if you're buying a second-hand machine? So from a customer's perspective, it doesn't really change what they need to do. As a broker or bank or whatever, there's some extra steps we would do. So from a dealer, literally, we just get a tax invoice. We can generate some loan documents for a private sale. You generally need to get an inspection done. You know, there's proof of ownership. Some And different lenders have different requirements around that. Like some of them will just accept rego papers as proof of ownership. Some will require either original invoice and um, and payment receipt, or you know if it's under finance, a payout letter. Um, others, if you can't provide that, will want a stat deck. So there's there's more paperwork involved for us that adds a few extra days. But from the customer's perspective, it doesn't really impact them at all. They don't really have to do anything extra. Mm hmm. All right. And what about time frames? Like how fast can people get uh, loans approved nowadays? You can. So you can. So I did one the other day where a customer of mine, his father was supposed to sort out some finance for a van and he didn't realise until he was going to pick it up that he hadn't. That was on, <laughs> he must have rang me about lunchtime on the Wednesday and we had that settled Friday morning. So it can get done in a day and a half. Like obviously this was an existing customer of mine. I had all these details. I had to get a signed privacy act off him. We got it approved, de generated document. So it sort of got – you can get it approved in a couple of hours um, if it meets all the criteria for low doc and basically system approves. And from there we get an invoice, generate the loan docs, and you can have it settled within a couple of hours as well once, once we submit it for settlement. Whereas if you're right. a private sale transaction and if it's more complex, full doc, you know, it can take up to a couple of weeks. Um, if we've got to get some information from the accountants, we've got to write up a big application and then once approval comes through, you know, there's the extra checks like, you know, we've got to get an inspection done, which a lot of them uh, can be done by Redbook over video call, which might happen the next day. But um, and then by the time the private seller gets you the information back, it can add a couple of days. So I'd say any go to woe for the complex ones, maybe two weeks from, from the time of inquiry to, to settlement. So, yeah. So once upon a time with inspections, they all had to be done. Like either I had to go out and inspect them or someone from the bank had to go out and inspect the asset if it's a private sale. But a company called Redbook, now um, the banks allow us to outsource that to Redbook and they, Redbook will do a video call with the vendor. The vendor will walk around, you know, show them the compliance plate, show them the odometer and each side of the asset and Redbook will take photos from their end and then they'll do up uh, like a detailed report with all the photos and send it to us and we use that as our inspection of the asset. So it's made it a bit easier, like particularly now dealing interstate, like, you know, if I was having to do a private sale in Victoria, I'm always having to get someone from the bank to go out and do it, um, being based up in Queensland. So it makes the process a lot easier. A quick shout out to our sponsors for this episode, JR Safety Co, Equipment Compliance, providing mobile risk assessments for all civil construction and agricultural industries. So what, what advice can you give to people that are looking to 
to get finance, to be better prepared? Yeah, I just, like I was saying, just engage with a broker or your banker first, just to find out the parameters, like what info you're going to need. Um, you know, we can, to a large degree, we can tell you what what you're going to be able to borrow. So if you say, I want to buy, if you came to me, you want to buy an excavator, um, I can say, I can do a servicing based on your figures and say, look, I can probably get you up to 150. So at least you know that way, like you're not going and looking at a machine for 250,000. Um, also, if we're going to have to do a full dock application and it's this time of year, so banks need, you know, um, now need 2023 tax. A lot of guys, myself included, still haven't done their tax. So at least you know, okay, I'm going to have to engage my accountant now while I'm shopping for whatever side so my tax is done. Problem is if, you know, if you find what you're buying, your tax isn't done and we're going to need it, you know, you're probably going to lose that truck because, you know, your accountant could take two, four weeks to, to get it done. Um, and, yeah, just, yeah, engaging with your broker or banker first, you know, it's just you find your, the parameters you need to work within. So even a, a lot of guys I do finance for that I do quite a bit for, when they're thinking of doing something, they'll ring me. I'll say, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Will it work before I go and spend too much time doing it? And I'll, I'll have a look at it and I'll come back and say, yeah, no, we can make this work. This is how we'll do it. Um, and then they can go off and, and source what they need to. Oh, cool. And um, I know that a lot of times when uh, I go to get finance, they often say the machines have to be, or trucks, have to be insured before yep. they do the finance. Is that still the case? Yeah, that's right. So we've got to have we've got to have insurance generally before settlement. A lot of finance companies, unless it's over a certain value, don't actually ask for us to send it to them. But, yeah, you know, we've, we've got to keep it on file, I suppose, for audit purposes. And it's also it's a good checklist because if, if I – forget to say to you and because if I didn't need insurance and if I don't remind, you know, sometimes I haven't put it in the email saying, you know, I need insurance. So then guys forget to insure stuff as well because it's just a subconscious thing. You go pick it up and you, you may not be insured. Then, you know, something goes wrong, you're not insured and you've got a $100,000 loan and nothing to show for it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's true. Um, and what's it like getting finance at the moment with all these like interest rate rises and stuff? Like, What's it like for people to get finance? Um, so I would, it hasn't got any harder to get finance. Um, obviously, it was difficult when rates went through the roof so quickly. Like, you know, we went from sort of low threes to within six or nine months, they went up about 4%. Um, they have stabilised now for probably the last nine months, so people are now getting used to, you know, rates are now somewhere generally new equipment somewhere in the sevens, depending on the week. They can fluctuate a little bit, but... Um, you know, guys are, are getting more used to it. But credit assessment was it it hasn't got any harder. The a lot of the banks still have the, all their no doc low doc policies and second tier lenders have theirs. Um, even full credit assessment. If if you can service on financials, you don't miss payments on other loans, you know, you're fine, basically. Um yeah. it, the only thing I'd say that's probably gotten a bit tricky with because the second-hand market's so inflated with trucks and that, now guys say once upon a time might have got a $120,000 tipper truck might have been eight years old. Now it's 15 years old. It can be a little bit trickier getting finance for that because banks can, once you get, you know, a 15-year-old truck can be hard to finance through banks. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the only thing that's made it a bit trickier is just the inflated second-hand market yep <clears throat> it makes sense because i know there was a stage where people were getting big dollars for for things that definitely weren't worth it oh no right. were... people were getting like uh with some stuff more than like i had a guy i did finance a vx land cruiser wagon for three years ago and he sold it for five thousand dollars more than what he paid for it so yeah <laughs> it's just mental oh, i know what you mean yeah, I bought a um, I bought a tipper and I used it for about a year, and then I ended up selling it for uh, basically the same as what I paid. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's unheard of. It's never happened before. So yeah, it's just yeah, it's wild. Yeah, crazy times. What are some of the challenges that you face when you're trying to get finance for people? Like you know, that do they take too long getting back to you with paperwork or things like that? Like what are you? What are you? Oh, I generally peeves? try to make the transaction as smooth as possible. So to a, 
where possible, I'll engage with the account to get any information. So I like to, generally my process will be if they're a new customer, I'll, um, I'll have a chat to them, work out if I'm going to need all financials full doc or if it's low doc. I'll send them a privacy act to sign and, you know, I'll get them to send me back their license, ABN and that. I'll do all the credit checks. I can get most of the information from that. And then mostly I'll um, ask them just to put me in touch with their account. And that way, you know, guys are on excavators or in trucks, you know, they don't, don't have that easy access to that information. So I'll, I'll then get off the account and what I can, um, all the information, and then basically anything else I need from there I can get off um, off the customer over the phone. So that way, you know, you're not chasing up too much information. You know, you guys, well, guys work 10, 11 hours a day. You don't want to be coming home and having to, to sort out all your paperwork. So, yeah, and try to make it generally as smooth as possible. But the hardest thing, mm-hmm. I suppose, at the moment, this time of year is back to my thing with the financials is come 1st of January. If we need to do full doc, the banks now want 2023 finalised financials and tax returns, even though they're not due for lodgement to April or May. So, you know, a lot of guys still haven't done their stuff. So, yeah, this this time of year can be tricky, you sort of January and February, because, you know, we, we, if we need to do full doc now, we need to wait until, until the accountant's done the tax. And obviously they've got a backlog of people, so they can't just do it tomorrow either. So that's probably the, the big thing. Yeah, so I know we touched on it a bit earlier. So what are the main checks that um, people should do when they're looking at buying, like, say, a second-hand machine? What, what, what should they be doing to make sure that it's uh, all good? Uh, well, I'd be getting a mechanic to look over anything because the amount of people that buy something second-hand, sight unseen, and then get it and it's got issues or, you know, it's not what they wanted, then then they're trying to sell it, they're going to lose money on it. Yeah, I'd be I'd be getting someone to go over it thoroughly. First, if it were me, if I was buying something secondhand, I'd be having a mechanic look at it for sure, just to make sure. You know, if you've got a prime mover, for example, if you have to replace the motor or something at early on, you know, you're up for sixty or seventy thousand dollars. So, you know, it's it's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, and if you haven't allowed for that, or you're getting the loan for the truck itself, you, you probably don't have that spare money to do nah, the motor. So then you're getting right. stuffed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and and it can it, it can send guys to the wall if, if that happens. If you've only got one maybe two trucks and, you know, you've got to um, find $70,000 for a motor. Well, you can't easily find, you can't really finance a motor. I mean, we can do like some unsecured business style lending where you pay it off over 12 months to two years, but, you know, the rates are obviously a lot higher than what you pay on a machine, being an unsecured loan as well. So, yeah, I'd, I'd um, if it were me, I'd definitely be having a mechanic look over, over anything just for peace of mind. I mean, the mechanic may not pick it up, but there's probably a good chance that they would if there's some issues with it. Yeah. And what about, um, obviously, people are always scared that they won't be able to make the repayments. Of, you know, banks going to come and take the vehicles off them. Has that ever happened? Or does it, what is it common that that actually happens, that things get repossessed? Oh, in my experience, the only people that get stuff repossessed are if guys, if guys are missing a payment or two and they, communicate with the lender the lender will be fine it's it, it's guys that you know get two three payments behind and won't take the phone calls of the lender um won't tell them what's going on that they're a chance of getting it um repossessed because uh, the thing is the lender doesn't want to repossess something unless they really have to because they're going to sell it at auction and they're going to lose money on it so i find if you work with a lender if you get a couple of payments behind but you say look oh, if what can i make sort of if we go to them and say, you know, can we make one and a half payments over four months to catch us up? Most lenders will work with you. Um, you know, the guys, yeah, that, that don't want to work with a lender, um, but will get stuff repossessed. But it's probably, you'd probably have to be five or six months behind before a lender will repossess. Like they'll, they'll do everything they can to work with you before repossession. That's the very last thing they want to do because it will go to auction and, you know, Something that's market yeah, value what's going on for hundred thousand dollars, they might only get sixty thousand at auction. So they can then obviously chase the customer for the money, but you know if the customer's not affording their payments there, there's probably no chance they're going to have the money for the um, for the forty thousand dollars shortfall either. Okay, so um, 
What about so in your in your job? Obviously, you've been doing this for years. Um, what's what's sort of the, the good things and the bad things about um, like what do you like and dislike? Oh, I enjoy dealing with um, people from you know all over all over the country. Um, I particularly like earth movement and transport guys. They're generally fairly laid back. I'm a fairly laid back sort of guy. I like to have a bit of a joke with guys on the phone and that sort of thing. I'm pretty pretty um, yeah easy to get along with. You know, I've got um, I've been to a guy's wedding in Melbourne the other year that you know met him through doing his finance. I go down to Apollo Bay, um, see a guy generally once a year. We go down there and get on the uh, source for the weekend and generally have a good time, even though the weather's not quite as good as up here in Queensland. <laughs> but um, yeah, that um, so I enjoy I enjoy all that sort of side. Um, probably the worst part about it is um, if for some reason you can't get. A guy finance making the phone call to let them know. It's generally never easy to make that call, but you know, you, it's just a call you've got to make. Don't sort of hide behind it. You know, if you just give give the person the reasons, you know, that generally most guys will understand. And you know, we try our best to get finance for everyone, but you know, you're never going to have a hundred percent success rate. So, yeah, that yeah. it can be long hours, I suppose. And generally, when when you're on holidays, you know, I'll still generally have to do an hours. Half an hour and hours work a day, you know. Even, even normally you can get away over Christmas for a couple of weeks and you don't have to. But yeah, this year for some reason, come a lot of guys seem to go back on the third up here. And yeah, and I always get phone calls from the third, even though we're away on holiday. So you know, you, you've just got to take a couple of those calls. And you know, most guys understand if you can't get right back to them. But yeah, but um, but overall, you know, I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. More than I disliked it, I suppose. So yeah, no, yeah. oh, yeah, that's true. Um, is there anything that you would like to add that I haven't sort of asked or covered? No, nah, not really. Not not that I can live with that. I mean, like I think the only thing I've sort of harped on a little bit about is you know I'd definitely engage with if you're going to have to get a loan for whatever you're buying, whether it be your banker, whether or your broker, I'd engage with them before spending too much time. Going and looking, at least, you know, that way you know what you're going to need, what you need to look for. Um, you know, it's no good looking for a 1996 Tibber truck if we can't get finance for it. So, yeah, that's probably the big thing I would I'd just engage with finance first. You know, we can get a pre – or anyone can get a pre-approval and it lasts for anywhere from three to six months. And if you don't use it, you don't use it. So, yeah. Okay. Um, what about if people keep skipping around from, from broker to broker? Like I've heard, I had a guy once buying something for me and he, um, he had like three or four different brokers on the go. How does that actually affect their credit rating or the, or the way they, their, you know, the outcome? Well, yeah, that can definitely affect their credit rating. Um, because the problem is if you start to get a lot, a number of inquiries on your credit file, your credit score goes down. And once you've, the lenders can then see if it, there's an inquiry from a, another lender a day or two before. So obviously if they're getting an inquiry, uh, if you're going to them, they're thinking that application's been declined. So, you know, you get three and 40 on the track and the fourth lender's looking at it going, well, hang on, what are we going to do this when obviously they've been declined three times before? Um, and if a guy comes to me and says they have also, they're also speaking to another broker, I'll, I'll say to them, look, if you're, if you're uh, down the track with that guy, St- stick with him. If he gets, if he can't do it, come back to me then. But I'm not going to put something up, and you know, a waste a bit of my time, and b get inquiries on this guy's file for for no reason. Um, if he's a f- further down the track with the other broker, unless of course yeah. it's the other broker is saying, you know, he might be playing him safe for argument's sake. I had one the other day where the other. The guy was dealing with a broker earlier, but was quoting him eleven percent. So we and we, you know, we could get it somewhere in the low sevens. Um, so that's why he came to me second. If, you know, if if a guy says, you know, this is what I've been quoted, I'm not real happy with it. Yeah, then yeah, sure, deal with another broker. But I don't see the benefit in having three or four guys put in applications at the same time. Really. Yeah. All right. And then, um, so yeah, so. So where can listeners uh, find you? So if they want to make contact and, and try and get some finance, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, generally, I suppose, email or um, or phone, you know, or we've got a website, Network Finance, or, um, you know, they can email me at robbie at networkfinance.com.au. 
or you know that, that's that's generally the easiest way to email phone and um yeah and i'm I always say to guys i'm happy to give anyone a quote have a chat you got any questions about finance doesn't matter if it doesn't go anywhere it takes me two or three minutes you know if um if someone wants to bounce an idea off me or just wants a quick quote to compare to someone it's no stress it doesn't take us very long to do so yeah and feel anyone can feel free to get in touch cool all right. Well, thanks for, for coming on to the show and, and sharing your knowledge about finance. Um, if anyone wants to get finance for a vehicle or a, a machine or something like that, sure, surely give Robbie a call. I'll put all his uh, information in the link in the bio description below. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Robbie. Nah, thanks for having me, Ivan. Thanks a lot, mate. And hopefully I've been part of some limited knowledge I have on uh, and help some listeners. <laughs> no, you did well, man. Thank you. Uh, all right, guys. Um, thanks again for listening. Make sure that you uh, like, follow, share the shit out of all this. Uh, go to my YouTube channel, Earthworks Hub. Um, subscribe. Uh, share share that to your friends as well. So follow us on all socials, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.